Welcome back to Corium. I'm Brian Gilberti, and today we're joined by one of our rock star chief residents, Dr. Mia Mulligan Buckmiller. Thanks for being on the show, Mia. Yeah, long time listener, first time guest. All right. So today we're going to talk about angioedema, a condition that we see not infrequently, but it's one of those conditions that really stokes fear when we see these severe cases. So can you start us off with a case? Yes. So I was called in to see a critical patient who had come in complaining of shortness of breath. I walk into the room, I see a younger patient using accessory muscles to breathe with a very obvious facial swelling, which is obviously a very scary situation as an emergency medicine doctor. And so we're trying to get the interpreter on the line, this patient did not speak English. And while we're doing that, one of the nurses asked me if I should give an EpiPen. We did that. And then a couple minutes later, got the interpreter on the line and were able to ask some questions. We found out that this patient had had previous episodes before and that this current attack had started with isolated forehead swelling that then gradually had started to include the face over a period of two days. There was no redness, there was no itching. This had also happened in her dad and she had for a year not been taking the medicine that she had been prescribed for this very exact pathogenesis. And so over the course of the day, we figured out that this was more hereditary angioedema rather than anaphylactic swelling. Okay, so excellent depiction of a case that really highlights the unpredictable nature of our work, which is making these life-saving decisions on the fly when not every detail is clear. And this just shows why understanding the fundamentals of angioedema is so crucial, because oftentimes we don't have time to open up up to date and review before taking our next steps. So very important to have this stored in our brain's local hard drive. Now, Mia, let's break down what angioedema really is and how its different forms affect our management. Sure. So angioedema is a swelling that happens through mucous membranes. This can be superficially all the way to the deeper mucous membranes we have in our body. And this happens because of vascular permeability that is increased through vasodilation, through small little holes in the mucous membranes that then cause fluid to shift from inside to outside into the tissues. There's a couple of different causes of this. I think the one that we're most familiar with is anaphylactic swelling, which is histamine mediated. This is usually more associated with urticarial hives or the rash and itching. And this is triggered by allergens, foods, triggers like insects or stings and medicines. But usually the patient is aware of these things. What we're talking about today is bradykinin mediated angioedema. Classically, this lacks urticaria and itching, and it's caused by a deficiency of C1 esterase inhibitor, which can be either acquired through different conditions that we'll talk about later, acquired through medicines, or inherited through genetics. The third category is kind of catch-all, meaning idiopathic. We don't know why or how. May have excellent review that underscores how the underlying mechanism influences both presentation and treatment. Now, could you walk us through the various clinical presentations we might encounter in the ED? Yeah, there's a couple different categories, and I think it makes sense to break it down into three. So swelling, that's kind of what angioedema is talking about. This is asymmetric. It's non-pitting. It's usually not painful. The skin, like we mentioned, can range between normal skin color versus red or erythematous. It can have itching. It cannot have itching. It can have hives. It cannot have hives. This can happen in all areas where there's mucous membranes, so all the way down from the lips, the mouth, all the way down to the GI tract. The second way this can manifest is respiratory-wise. So I think that's kind of the scariest one, which is that the swelling can then impact the airway and cause obstruction. If it's upper respiratory especially, you'll have strider, labored breathing, sensation of throat closure. You might have trouble breathing and talking. The third category of symptoms is abdominal symptoms. There's obviously a lot of mucous membranes in the GI tract, especially in the bowel. And angioedema there can look like acute abdomen. So it can have nausea, vomiting, pain. You can have diarrhea. You can have increased pressures, which then can cause ischemia and very dangerous complications. So that's a good thing to think about. Yeah, it's really eye-opening to see how angioedema can manifest in such varied ways, from subtle, localized swelling to potential airway emergencies. So I'm curious, how does the timing of these symptoms play into your assessment in the emergency department? Yes. So 
the histamine angioedema or anaphylaxis can occur over minutes to hours. That usually resolves pretty quickly with the appropriate interventions. And then you have bradykinin mediated hereditary angioedema, which usually develop a little bit more slowly and can last much longer if untreated, up to days. Yeah, and really makes sense that rapid onset with histamine reactions versus that slower, more drawn out course in hereditary cases really helps differentiate what we're dealing with. Okay, let's get a bit more nerdy here and dive into how a deficiency in C1 inhibitor sets off this cascade. So there's a couple different ways that this can happen. The main topic today is hereditary angioedema, so we'll talk about that first. What happens here is you have a deficiency of C1 esterase inhibitor. This can happen with a variety of different ways. It can be genetic, so a hereditary. It's autosomal dominant. And what happens is C1 esterase inhibitor inhibits calocrine. Calocrine works by directly producing bradykinin. So when you have a functional C1 esterase inhibitor, you have a regulation of bradykinin. Therefore, when you have a deficiency of C1 esterase, you have uncontrolled, unregulated production of bradykinin. This looks like a lot of cutaneous mucosal swelling like we've already talked about, but you usually don't have a red hivey rash. The onset is usually very young, and it can be exacerbated by different physical stressors, mental stress, hormone changes, different medical procedures, but doesn't have to be. And the frequency can vary quite radically as well from weeks to yearly. The second way you can get C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency is by acquiring it. You can acquire it through certain pathologies. Most classically is a B cell lymphoma, a non-Hodgkin lymphoma specifically, but it can also happen with autoimmune diseases or MGUS. What happens here is you just essentially lose your C1 esterase inhibitor over time, and it leads to an acquired deficiency. So the onset is much slower, and you have less commonly associated GI tract symptoms. And the third way you can get a deficiency of C1 esterase inhibitor is by taking different medicines. We usually hear about this with ACE inhibitors, but it can happen with ARBs, although less commonly. And what happens here is the ACE inhibitor works to inhibit ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin converting enzyme at baseline works to inhibit bradykinin production. So when you're taking an ACE inhibitor, that function is inhibited. So you have an increase in bradykinin. Okay, very good. A super complex topic, even when you try to distill it down or head spinning, but basically bradykinin is bad. And it's yeah, bad because bad. it causes increased vascular permeability and vasodilation. Now, with that in mind, when you encounter these patients in the emergency department, how do you decide when to lean on labs and imaging to guide your diagnosis, or do they even have a role at all from our perspective? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I think we might not benefit directly from labs in the emergency room, but it can definitely help our colleagues down the road. So that the main diagnosis of a hereditary angioedema is setting a C4 level. That won't come back hopefully by the ED stay. Hopefully they're dispoed by then. <laughs> but that's, that's the diagnosis. In terms of imaging, it kind of depends on what the symptoms are. I think especially if someone has an acute abdomen or a swelling of the abdomen, imaging will be obtained. But I think as with all patients that come into the emergency room, the main approach is ABCs. We're going to think about the airway. You're going to want to be really prompt with addressing that and make sure you're treating all of the symptoms that you see. Perfect. And I couldn't agree more that our immediate focus in the emergency department is always going to be ABCs and making sure that their airway is protected. Now, beyond that, Mia, tell us about what medications we have up our sleeve for treating angioedema. So beyond that, there's a couple of drugs that we can talk about. In terms of differentiating between anaphylactic or anaphylaxis, hysminergic angioedema and hereditary angioedema, that's a tough thing to do within the first 10 minutes of patient arrival. And so I think do you give epi? Do you not give epi? I don't think it hurts in this case. If it is hysminergic mediated, that's a life-saving intervention. And if it's hereditary angioedema and bradykinin mediated, it's not going to necessarily hurt them. But if you do want to treat the bradykinin mediated angioedema, there's a couple ways you can do that. So one is by giving acatabant. Acatabant is a direct inhibitor to bradykinin. It works at the same receptor, so it's an antagonist. And it just thereby decreases the effect 
of bradykinin. You also have a calentide, which is a calocrine inhibitor. And so that prevents the production of bradykinin. And then there's C1 esterase concentrate, which I've never seen in the emergency room, but I'm sure it exists somewhere. And that essentially just replenishes the deficiency you have. And then the last one that we'll talk about is TXA, which is what we ended up giving this patient. And that works through kind of a secondary process that activates bradykinin through the fibrinolysis pathway. Okay, so really five major players here. Mm-hmm. Icatabant, acalantide, C1 esterase inhibitor concentrate, TXA, and FFP. FFP. And FFP works because it's plasma that has naturally occurring C1 esterase inhibitor in it already. And so by giving FFP, you're thereby kind of supplementing and replenishing the C1 esterase in the patient. Okay, so we're essentially filling up the C1 esterase tank here. Now, Mia, shifting gears, what other complications should we be mindful of? And specifically, can you walk us through how bowel wall edema presents in these patients and what we need to watch out for? Yeah, I think this is the kind of the scariest one for me because I didn't remember this association before preparing for this podcast. So when you have bowel wall angioedema, you have a lot of swelling and because of that, it can go so far as to cause compartment syndrome, which is a surgical emergency. And patients might present with pain, nausea, vomiting. They can have diarrhea. They will have edema on imaging of CT. And it's going to be a good one to think about when you see these weird imaging results. But it's something that I would not have associated with bradykinin in the first place. Right. And I think a lot of us don't associate bowel wall edema with angioedema. So it's really good to bring that up in our episode so that it's on our radar. And I think if somebody comes in with this manifestation, with this presentation of angioedema, our hand's going to be forced to get that CAT scan to rule out alternate diagnoses. All right. Mia, you did an excellent job going over this really difficult topic. Let's go over some take-home points. First, ensuring that their airway is secure, they're controlling their secretions, their airway is patent is going to be our priority here. Next, recognize histamine-mediated angioedema by the presence of hives and itching, unlike the bradykinin variant. Third, tailor management. Use epinephrine for histamine reactions and consider bradykinin antagonists, calocrine inhibitors, or FFP for hereditary cases. TXA is really going to be an off-label medication that we could reach for that isn't as supported by the data, but if you have nothing else, then that's an option. Remember that ACE inhibitors are a frequent trigger for bradykinin-mediated angioedema, and in rare situations, ARBs are also the culprits. And finally, trust your clinical judgment in the emergency department as labs and imaging often assist with downstream care rather than initial decision-making. Okay. That'll do it for this episode. Mia, thanks for being on the podcast with us. Thanks for having me.